Let's get started. Um, welcome to our first Hutch at Home event. And as you uh, probably noticed, we're going to try having these through the months of May and June, same time, same link, every week. And um, now we pretty much have um, May booked. Uh, the last edition, which you might not have heard of, is um, somebody who's um, actually working in uh, Trevor Bedford's lab, Ellie Black. And so she's a graduate student and um, should be really interesting. And uh, I wanted to um, welcome everybody and uh, turn things over as quickly as possible to Alicia Morales, who is a science educator. Many of you already um, know her. Uh, she's also a research tech in the Warren Lab, and um, I think you'll be especially interested in some of the uh, new research that she'll be discussing at the end that includes um, some research that she's been working on as well. So uh, again, welcome everybody, and I am going to turn it over to Alicia. Thanks, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. It's uh, nice to uh, be here with you. So um, I have created this uh, presentation uh, for high school students. And so it's uh, many of you probably have um, a lot of knowledge surrounding these uh, topics that we'll be discussing. And so um, I really want to invite you to interact and participate. Um, in my Zoom window, I have the uh, participants in the chat window open. So if you have a question or if you need me to speed up or slow down or you're like, yeah, 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 I know all this stuff, please feel free to use the, the Zoom participant little buttons. And with that, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so this is um, Immunology 101, a crash course on the immune system and immunotherapies. So we will be looking at um, a kind of a very uh, broad view of immunology uh, and kind of the some of the newer technologies in immunotherapy. So hi, uh, I'm Alicia Morales, as Jeannie mentioned. That's me, that's my professional headshot. Um, like Jeannie said, I am a, a technician in the Warren lab. Before I started or uh, uh, in science at the Hutch, I was a high school science teacher. And so that's how I know many of you guys um, and how I got connected with SCP. So these are my wonderful lab folks. Um, and I always kind of give a shout out to them because without them, none of my stuff would be possible. Um, my presentations are very silly. And <laughs> so you'll be seeing some things that um, are silly in nature, just a heads up. Um, you might also hear from my dog, Toby. Um, he also gets very excited about science, so if you hear him kind of whooping it up in the background, uh, I apologize ahead of time. So um, I'm also part of Hutch United, which is a grassroots organization uh, founded in 2013 at the Hutch, and our mission is to foster a supportive and inclusive community for scientists and also promote the success of underrepresented uh, and self-identified minority scientists. There's a lot of volunteers in the group. We love to be involved with uh, classrooms. So if you ever wanted to, a scientist to kind of Skype in like we're doing right now, or come and visit your classroom in the next year, please uh, give us a shout. All right. So um, I always like to start this by, um, so I would like for you guys to either use the, oops, use the chat feature if you would, and talk about um, what does it feel like when you are sick. So use the chat function in Vume, talk about what symptoms and feelings alert you that you're not feeling well. So let's just take a minute and, uh, and have at it. Excellent. So I'm seeing I feel like my life is a wreck. Um, oh, headache, tired, super tired. 
lots of tired, loss of appetite, high temperature, headaches, fever, ringing in the ears, sore throat, runny nose, low energy, existential, I can't think straight, chills, trouble sleeping. Yeah, you smell differently. That's a good one. Tired and lazy. Very good. Crabby, can't taste. Yeah, when you're all congested and stuff like that. Excellent. Excellent job. So, yeah, so when you're sick, you, your body, you definitely notice the changes. You, um, uh, there's a high fever, you get chills, you're achy, you're lethargic. There's a lot of things that alert you that uh, tell you that something's not wrong or something's not right in your system. And so a lot of that has to do with uh, the fight that your immune system uh, does whenever you have an invading pathogen. So um, you usually want to ask, like, what do you know about the immune system? A lot of times what I hear is our immune system keeps us from getting sick, or when we do get sick, our immune system is what makes us feel better. But uh, I would say for like 90% of the population, that's pretty much all that they think the immune system does. But the immune system does so much more than that. So I like to borrow heavily from a company called Kirkgesagt, uh, which means in a nutshell in German, I probably butchered it, but you'll be seeing a lot of their pictures and I've included uh, links to these particular videos that I reference uh, at the end of this presentation. But the immune system does many, many jobs. So uh, they communicate with each other, they can cause inflammation, activate other cells, produce antibodies, um, and the cells in the immune system do multiple jobs. So for example, here's a little macrophage, which is um, one of the guards of the immune system. And its primary job is to kill enemies, but it also causes inflammation, helps communicate with other cells and activate other cells. So the, our immune system tends to look a lot like this, where we have lots of different interactions with lots of different cells that do lots of different jobs. But to make it a little less complicated, what we are going to do is we're going to look at a flow chart. And I'm a sucker for a good flow chart. So every day, our bodies are being bombarded with things that are trying to invade us, like virus, very apropos for this uh, uncertain time, bacteria, other pathogens, everything tries to invade our bodies, uh, but it encounters our first line of defense. So one of the biggest uh, components of the immune system is our skin. It's a great barrier, but as anybody with skin will tell you, <laughs> it's not perfect. It's porous, there are holes in it, we get cut. So when our first line is breached, we are, our innate immune system is activated. So you, the innate immune system are cells that aren't necessarily specific for any certain type of pathogen. They just notice and they're on the lookout for anything that doesn't belong. And so this isn't an extensive list of all of the components of the innate immune system, but uh, macrophages was a cell that I had mentioned earlier. Macrophages are posted at every opening of your body. And so they're kind of like the bouncers. They kind of watch what's coming in and what's going out. Dendritic cells are the information gatherers. And so they will pick up pieces of bacteria or pathogens, we'll stick them to the outside of them, and then they will go to the, lyrics, the nearest lymph node to activate our next line of defense. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, natural killer cells are, um, are kind of self-explanatory. They, their job is to kill. And a lot of times they kill indiscriminately, which can become a problem because not only do they kill like the bacterial cells, or our cells that are infected with a virus, they can also kill healthy cells as well. So um, our immune system has a lot of checkpoints, which we'll also talk about a little bit later, that helps keep it in check. So back to dendritic cells. So we something comes into our body, it encounters our innate immune system, 
90% of the infections pretty much get stopped there. But if something makes it past our first line, which is our skin, and gets overwhelmed at our second line, the innate immune system, those dendritic cells will take pieces of that invading object or uh, invading pathogen and bring it to the lymph node where they will activate T cells. And so moving into T cells, we're talking about the adaptive immune system. So these are cells that are specific for a specific pathogen. Um, macrophages will eat anything and anything, anything and everything that comes into the body that doesn't belong there. T cells will only recognize the pathogen that they are, um, that they are built to see. So there's a bunch of different types of T cells, but the next interaction that happens in this flow chart is T cells will activate the B cells and B cells create antibodies. And so um, antibodies are just little protein tags that uh, the B cells create that can tag a pathogen and alert the immune system that, oh, this is something that needs to go as well. So uh, our T and B cells, come in, they win, turn the tide in our infection. And so um, suddenly we no longer are, have uh, an invading force in our bodies. When our infections are over, most of the cells that are created um, or duplicated during this time will die through a process of apoptosis. But some of them hang around and become memory B and memory T cells. And so when we say like, once you get sick with certain pathogens, you never get that specific pathogen again, it's these memory B and these memory T cells that stick around to make sure that if that pathogen, if that pathogen did try to come into your body, um, that uh, we have a very quick response kind of uh, waiting in the wings that can uh, get rid of that pathogen before it becomes a problem, before you even notice that you uh, get sick. So that is quick. I feel like I move through these things very quickly. And so um, I just wanted to stop here for just a second. Have I lost anybody? Does anyone have any questions? How are we doing? I see thumbs up. Excellent. All right. Moving right along then. Oop. Okay. So um, in these times, right, with SARS-CoV-2, so um, I felt since we're talking about the immune system uh, to add a little bit of information about that as well. And again, I borrowed a lot from Kirk Zacht and they, cause they make great pictures. So uh, this is taken from their newest uh, YouTube video about the coronavirus explained and uh, what you should do. It's great, great, great for the teachers out there. I uh, heavily suggest that you find this video on YouTube and send it to your students. But um, so SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the sickness, um, COVID-19 which uh, is kind of gets shortened to coronavirus. So what happens is um, we get uh, these uh, viral particles, um, they take root in our lungs and they uh, in inject the epithelial cells in our lungs with their uh, DNA, RNA and uh, hijack the cell's machinery. So they start making more and more of those cells or more and more of those viral particles, excuse me. And so um, what ends up happening is, so our immune system recognizes that something is wrong and comes in. So we have kind of neutrophils and macrophages. Um, and, but the problem is, is when they get called in to this problematic area, sometimes they also get infected with uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And they start going nuts and release what's called a cytokine storm. 
And so a cytokine storm um, is kind of a cocktail of how uh, cells interact with each other. So they're calling in for new cells, they're marking cells that are healthy for destruction. Uh, they're killing each other, it's just a, a, a huge mess. And when your immune system starts to go haywire, like your immune system is supposed to be offering this protective support for your lungs and it's supposed to be getting rid of of all of these viruses. And so when things go haywire, uh, a lot of times that's where we start to see like a lot of secondary infections come in, like pneumonia and whatnot. And it's just uh, one of the reasons why this particular virus is so lethal. So um, this, I, I just wanted to kind of take a quick um, diversion uh, to talk a little bit about this. I'm not, um, I'm not a, a virologist or uh, very well versed in what's going on with a lot of the SARS-CoV-2 research. Um, the Hutch is doing a lot on it. I uh, suggest uh, checking out Trevor Bedford's lab or uh, Next Strain um, to get some information about uh, kind of the movement of SARS-CoV-2. Um, but uh, it does touch a little bit about on the immune system. And so I thought it would be appropriate to add that in here. But getting back to the immune system and cancer cells. So not only do, does your immune system uh, recognize when uh, our cells are sick, they can also recognize cancer cells and they can kill them. So I like to describe this interaction uh, as a secret handshake. So if you've ever had a secret handshake with your friends, like you know that there's a certain way that you, the two of you connect that helps you recognize each other, right? I'm hoping you all have had secret handshakes before. Um, so in just normal interactions between T cells and healthy cells, this is one of the ways that our cells can recognize self. Um, and here we have a little picture that makes it a little bit more scientific than a, a fun GIF. Um, so we have our T cells, they, can, they have receptors where they can recognize self um, and, and, and receptors where they can recognize non-self things. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, they can also recognize when a cell is sick. So, um, and when we mean by that, like when a cell has uh, becomes cancerous, cells will start to produce tumor antigens on the outside of their cells. Um, like, so taking it back to uh, the central dogma, right? DNA, RNA proteins. So when you have disruptions in your DNA, you have, you create proteins that are wonky. They're just not right. And for uh, a monitoring T cell passing by, if that cell is producing a protein that is not uh, what it's supposed to look like, that's something that can alert that passing by T cell that this cell um, is not acting correctly. It's not acting right. And so, it can start that uh, apoptotic process. Right. So, um, so then whenever I have this conversation with people, I always at this point in time, people are always like, okay, but wait, if our bodies can fight off cancer, like why do we even get cancer, right? So I'm also gonna stop here again. So, um, so we talked about secret handshakes. We talked a little bit about SARS-CoV-2. How's everyone doing? Can I get another thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up? All right. All right, here we go. So uh, if my body can fight off cancer, why do I even get it in the first place? So uh, the first reason is cancer multiplies. It grows very, very quickly. And so um, Earlier, I kind of showed you a flow chart between uh, like the start of an infection and the very mm -hmm. end of an infection. Yeah. And to get from one side of that flow chart to the other, it takes some time. And so, um, and there are processes that happen in the adaptive immune system that make those cells 
uh, more specialized for those particular antigen proteins. And that also takes time. And so while our immune system is doing what it does at its normal pace, we have cancer cells that have ripped out all of the stop signs in, uh, in the cell cycle and just keep multiplying and multiplying. So sometimes uh, it's a numbers game. Cancer cells grow too quickly. It outpaces our immune system. So cancer also is very, very smart and has developed ways to evade the, the immune system. And one of the, um, one of the most talked about ways that cancer has done this is uh, these PDL1s or these PD1. Uh, so the PD1 receptor and this PDL1 ligand, which is on the cancer cell. So I'm going to see if I can play this. So we have these uh, ligands on the cancer cell. And what these ligands do is they bind to the PD1 receptor on a T cell. And it will basically use the regulatory systems of the T cell to shut it down. So uh, I like to say uh, it's night night time. So when that PDL1 ligand from the tumor cell hits the PD1 receptor on the T cell, it shuts it down. It turns it off. It all of the mechanisms that a T cell uses to start the apoptotic, apoptotic process to, to recognize a foreign antigen, um, the, T, the tumor cell says, there's nothing to see here. I'm going to move you right along. It's very, very crafty the way that cancers do this. Um, this is the basis for, I believe it's Keytruda, which is a, uh, a PDL1 inhibitor. So uh, this, these interactions are ways that we have developed some immunotherapies uh, to help T cells fight cancers. But we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm getting ahead of myself because I just think it's so cool. Um, cancer can evolve. So um, as we go through the cell cycle and we are creating more and more and more cells, uh, at a pace that uh, is super quick, we have a lot of chance for errors, and those errors can uh, lead to uh, new advantages for cancer cells. And so a lot of times uh, our bodies can't keep up with shifting targets. Uh, and that's also um, a problem for some immunotherapies. And we'll talk about, again, talk about that a little bit later. But um, cancer also moves around, which makes it pretty hard to treat when you have uh, a target or a sickness that keeps moving from place to place. That's a lot of battlefronts on a lot of places. That's a lot of resources for your body to have to um, put up these defenses or um, to use these interactions to have these multiple cells at multiple places. Uh, it's, it's just, it can overwhelm the immune system. So even though our immune system is fully primed and able to get rid of cancer cells, sometimes uh, we, uh, cancer has developed these ways of getting around uh, the efficiency of the adaptive immune system. So then the next question I always get, so, uh, so, so what you're telling me, right, is that the immune system is just useless, right, when it comes to cancer, um, which is not true at all. In fact, the immune system and harnessing the immune system, redirecting the immune system, uh, buffering the immune system are uh, pretty much the newest thing in, in cancer research and uh, cancer cure development. So um, what the Hutch and many other places are starting to do is harness the killing capacity or the killing efficiency of T cells. So, uh, and this comes in many different flavors of uh, T cell therapies. And the Hutch uh, pretty much does them all. So we have some pioneers at the Hutch. 
Uh, one of them is Stan Rydell. Um, he and his lab, they are pioneering some of the CAR T cells, and we'll talk about what a CAR T cell is. Um, Dr. Sylvia Lee also uh, is doing a lot of work in TILS, which is another type of T cell therapy. And uh, my group, uh, which is a great example of transgenic TPRs, um, and we'll talk about, again, what are the difference with these different uh, T cell therapies? So let's talk about TILS first. So TIL stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So a lymphocyte is a white blood cell, or in this case specifically, what we're looking for is T cells. So when we take a biopsy of a tumor, um, there's a lot of tumor cells in there. There's a, usually uh, blood uh, cells and a component of uh, blood are T cells. So we have these T cells that are found in these uh, biopsy tumors. And so what we do is we can separate them out and grow them individually um, and then test them, these TILs, these lymphocytes that were found in the tumor, test them with, uh, with a tumor to see if they're reactive. And if they do react, then we can reinfuse them back into the patient. So it's like, um, it's like recycling, kind of. So you get the cells, you pull them out of the body, you grow them up, you beef them up. And if they recognize tumors, it's your body's own T cell defense just augmented temporarily outside of the body and then refused back into uh, the body, which is super cool. So um, uh, the next T cell therapy that we'll talk about is CAR T cells. And so this, there's been a lot of news around CAR T cells. And so CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. So um, I like to think of CAR T cells as like the very best of B cells and T cells. So um, CAR T cell receptors aren't normally found in nature. So what they do is they take the best parts of a T cell receptor, which recognize antigens, and B cell receptors um, and fuse them together. And that's where the chimeric part of CAR, uh, chimeric antigen receptor comes from. And so there's been a lot of success with CAR T cells, especially with uh, blood cancers. So I've listed some, so acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, chronic lymph lymphocytic leukemia, CLL, and some Hodgkin's lymphomas. Um, lots of great success with blood tumors. The newest part uh, in CAR research is trying to find ways to move these CARs into the solid tumor arena. And there's been some, uh, some areas uh, for improvement with, uh, with CAR T cells in the solid tumor arena, but uh, they are so powerful and they work so well that uh, there's a lot of promise there. So uh, last but not least, these are my favorite because this is part of my uh, project in the lab. So transgenic TCRs. So transgenic means that we are infusing new genes into a T cell. So <clears throat> what we can do is we can take the receptor that recognizes a particular tumor antigen. So again, thinking about the central dogma, uh, a receptor is a protein, right? So if we want a particular cell to express a particular protein, we can give it a new DNA so that it'll make RNA and make these proteins. So we take the genetic code from these tumor recognizing T cells and we can put them into healthy T cells that see all sorts of stuff and pretty and effectively redirect those uh, normal T cells to become tumor recognizing. So, and we give them a new receptor that sees that cancer because uh, if, if they don't have that receptor, those T cells, those powerful weapons, they don't 
they don't see those cancers, they can't work to, to uh, clear that tumor. And so this is um, a, a part where we are starting to see the use of CRISPR technologies, which is super cool. Um, mm -hmm. My lab is starting to play around with this, where we can knock out the old receptor and knock in uh, the new one. So it's uh, a bait and switch, if you will. Uh, and uh, this gets rid of some of the, uh, this gets rid of the old T cell receptor that's on the cell. Because when you give the new TCR to, or the new DNA to the, uh, to the white blood cells, to the T cell, they still have that old receptor on there. And so mm -hmm. there's potential problems. We don't know what that old receptor recognizes. It could be, um, it could be a, a self antigen, and that would be awful to uh, grow a, um, a, a multiply multiple cells that see a self antigen end up giving somebody uh, a, a large problem. Uh, they could be, I mean, since we don't know what that antigen sees, it makes more sense to CRISPR the old antigen out, or excuse me, the old T cell out, put in our T cell receptor of interest and just let them go about their, uh, their merry way. So um, let's see. So um, those are T cell therapies. Uh, I know um, I kind of gave like a 30,000 foot view um, of all the different flavors of T-cell therapy. Let me go back a little bit. Boop, boop, boop. Are there any questions? How are we doing so far? Up, down? Okay. I am monitoring the chat, so if you have questions, please type them in there. Um, so... Um, how are we doing? Oh man, I'm going so fast. So um, there are other ways that we can boost the immune system. So um, T cell therapies are kind of the hot and cool thing um, in immunotherapies for cancers, but there are other immunotherapies that um, we can use to boost the immune system. So um, there are antibodies that we can use, um, antibodies that are produced just like from the B cells, but um, produce them outside of the lab or outside of the body in the lab. Um, and not only can we um, just create B cells or antibodies, we can tie um, uh, like mo chemo molecules or other sorts of fluorescent proteins to uh, kind of help tag those immune system, or those cancer cells and um, help them be more easily recognized bits of the immune system. Um, we have nonspecific immunotherapies. So, <clears throat> excuse me, T cells are super specific, but we can give, um, we can give patients nonspecific immunotherapies that are just that just boost the immune system. So, for example, um, so we, my lab, my group studies renal cell carcinoma, uh, and one of the therapies for people with that particular cancer is high dose IL two. IL two is a cytokine, um, and cytokines are molecules that uh, cells use to communicate between each other. So if we give this high dose IL-2, uh, T cells that are in the body that are currently fighting cancers uh, get boosted from that cytokine. Um, and so it's not specific for those particular T cells, it's for every T cell, but for those T cells that are actually kind of engaged in uh, fighting a particular antigen, excuse me, it helps kind of boost them. So there's also virus therapies, which I think is super interesting. So <clears throat> these are modified viruses that can be injected like right into the tumor. Um, 
And the one that I think is really interesting is a virus therapy called TVEC. And it's an FDA approved therapy for myeloma, or excuse me, melanoma. Um, and it's a modified herpes simplex virus. So the same virus that gives people uh, cold sores can be redirected and used as a cancer therapy, which is like super duper cool. Um, and there's also cancer vaccines. And so a lot of the, so the first three things that I talked about, antibodies, nonspecific immunotherapies, virus therapies, and even immunotherapies, they're all reactive. So once a person is diagnosed with cancer, these are kind of the therapies that can be used. Cancer vaccines are great because they are preventative. So um, the example that I'm giving here is the HPV vaccine. And so being able to harness the immune system to direct it to recognize viruses that down the line can give people cancer is an immunotherapy. It's using the immune system to fight cancer. It's a, it's a preemptive strike, which is also super interesting. So that, uh, like I said, I moved pretty quickly. Um, see a couple of questions. Um, so the first one, does your lab ever allow high school student interns? So my lab um, does not uh, usually allow interns for long periods of time um, because there are a lot of things in our labs that uh, minors should not be around. We also do a lot of HIV. Um, we work with samples that have high viral loads of HIV. Um, and so my lab isn't approved for having minors, like for long periods of time, but for like uh, shadowing for a day, yes, um, we do allow that. Um, and then, so the next question was, so how do you know which segments to edit with CRISPR to knock out the old receptors? Which is a great question. So um, T cell receptors have, uh, Mm, defined beginning and end points. So the stuff in the middle is all uh, variable and that variability um, comes from a couple of different ways. So we have many, many genes in our genomes that uh, can be kind of cut and pasted to make T cell receptors. And then as you are making them, there's a little bit of variability um, with uh, the addition of some point mutations, but we get these, this beautiful combinatorial diversity with uh, these genes uh, in between two very, very well-defined sections. And so what we can do is we can um, make guide RNAs. So um, I'm just going to give a quick overview of CRISPR. So um, if you want to cut out a gene, what you do is you have these guide RNAs, right? So this is, I don't know if you guys can actually even see me, but um, you have your DNA, right? And at the very end of the gene segment, you make guide RNAs um, that would sit at that particular point of the DNA. And that guide RNA tells the, the CRISPR-Cas9, the actual uh, enzyme that does the cutting, here's where you need to cut here and here. So the guide RNAs say to cut here and here. And then what you do is you have another template, your template of the, for my particular case, you have the template of the, uh, the new TCR that you want to add in there. Um, and so you, you add in the, those little pieces of DNA and some DNA repair enzymes, and you CRISPR in that new, so knock in and knock out, you put in the new TCR. So um, uh, it's, so getting back to the original question, how do you know which segments to, to edit out? Do you make guide RNAs for those constant regions that kind of flank either side of the T cell receptor where the receptor uh, genes are at? I hope that answers your question, Eric. All right. So 
Um, I talked for a bit and I, I always get super excited about these things. So I feel like I go very, very quickly. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat window or if you uh, just feel like sharing or whatever, feel free to talk because uh, because I just want to hear your voices. A little bit more about your um, research with the um, with your you know modified T cell transgenic T cell receptors and what diseases are you working with and what does that you know what does that entail from beginning to end uh, in order to try to think about turning that into a therapy. Okay, so um, the story of my project starts um, back in uh, the early 2000s with one of the clinicians that used to work in my lab. He's now an associate member. Scott Tycote is a, uh, is a cancer, is a kidney cancer doctor. And what he thought and what he saw in the literature is a particular gene that got turned on in cancer cells uh, that shouldn't be turned on. So the gene produces a protein called 5T4, and this gene usually gets turned on when we are um, multi, like, like before we're even fetuses, when we're just cells dividing at the development stage. Um, and so this protein turns on to, ke to keep these cells kind of cohesive so you don't you know, float away. <laughs> uh, and so this gene aberrantly turns on for um, a, almost all of these particular, uh, are for all of these particular cancer cases. Um, it also turns on in a couple of different, um, different cancers, like for some breast cancer tumors, this is a gene that aberrantly turns on as well. But so my kidney cancers uh, express this protein. And so Scott said to himself, I wonder if there are T cells in the blood that recognize this particular protein. And so he essentially went fishing. He um, used the, the protein and tagged it with a fluorescent marker and stained um, a bunch of uh, blood cells to see if any, did anybody recognize this protein? Uh, and if so, he sorted them out. And so he found these T cells in a couple of cancer patients and also some normal donors that recognize this particular protein. And so he grew them up, um, was able to show that they recognize the tumors. Um, and this particular target um, made for a great immunotherapy target because it's not something that's turned on really anywhere else or really shouldn't be. Um, so we have a target that is pretty much exclusive. We have T cells that recognize this target. It's enough to publish on it. And then he lost all the funding <laughs> and uh, the, that um, project kind of died. So um, a couple years later, we get some money, the lab gets some money, um, but these cells have been sitting around for a long, long time. And so what we ended up doing was we sequenced the receptor um, and that's how we were able to get the genetic sequence of these TCRs that recognize the, the aberrant protein that's found on the kidney cell or kidney cancer. And so to kind of talk to Jeannie's question, when you're looking, or if you wanted to develop like a T cell therapy, what you want to do is to find a target that is um, ubiquitously expressed in your cancer um, and hopefully found in other cancers as well. So cancers can be very heterogeneity, heterogeneity they have a lot of heterogeneity, there we go. And so if you have a target that's only expressed on 50% of the cancer cells, it's not a very good target because at the very best, you're creating a, uh, a, a therapy that only recognizes half of the, of the tumor. So you want to find a target that is on all of the cancer cells 
um, and hopefully only on the cancer cells. You don't want to target a protein that's found on brain cells uh, because then you get um, on target but off tumor effects. So um, you could effectively unleash the immune system to recognize uh, a protein on cells that uh, is very useful uh, and necessary um, you know, for you to be alive and to function correctly. So, um, so you want it to be only on the tumor and you want to have T cells that recognize that particular protein very well. So there are degrees of affinity um, that a T cell can have for a particular target. Um, I like to think of it as like, uh, like pizza. Like there are like, um, I love pizza and I will eat almost any pizza. Um, I have a high affinity for it. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what configuration it is. I will, I will eat it whenever, unless it's pineapple on pizza. That's weird. Now, but speaking of pineapple, I only like pineapple uh, fresh. I can't eat it from a can. It's weird. I have a very specific tolerance for pineapple. T cells are the same way. So some T cells can have a very specific affinity where if it's a protein that's only in one particular configuration, that's the only way that it can be recognized. Some T cells have a little bit of wiggle room where, uh, yeah, I can see that protein. If the protein changes a little bit, uh, it's, it doesn't really matter. It still kind of recognizes it. So you want to have uh, a T cell that's just like laser focused on that particular protein. Uh, because if you release something that's not, not super specific, you could get some off target effects. It might not bind very well, like when it actually gets into the tumor environment. So, um, so you want to, so going over it again, you want to have uh, a T cell that has a, a target that's only on the cancer that's found on all of the bits of cancer and that recognizes it really well. And so that's what Scott had um, in the original, getting back to my story. That's what we have is um, the, the genetic code for those particular T cells that recognize that antigen really well. And I feel like I kind of answered that question. <laughs> uh, that was a, a long and it's uh, a long-winded kind of answer. Where are you in the process now? So we have published, um, you can, I am a published author. So you can, <laughs> you can actually uh, look up our paper um, where you can see the affinity the, of, of the T cells. Mm -hmm. um, and what we would like to do is to go into phase one trials. Um, and that takes a lot of money. So uh, we, we haven't gone in there yet. We are exploring other options. Um, the next phase in our lab is we're looking at recapitulating the tumor environment uh, through what we call a RCC on a chip. So making little tumor spheroids and putting it in a collagen matrix to kind of mimic what the tumor environment would look like. And so challenging the T cells uh, to, to kill tumors in that environment. So. Uh, that's kind of the next step. So um, I, I want to answer these questions. So uh, let's see. Hey, Marcy. Um, is there a way to increase the amount of antigens on the surface of a cancer cell to maximize success? So uh, that's a great question. And that is something that a lot of people are exploring through uh, the use of uh, vaccinia viruses. So another viral protein or another viral immunotherapy to put into cancers to kind of have them upregulate those targets. Um, so you, that's not something my lab is particularly working on, but I do know that is an area of research in other labs. It's a great question. So um, from Kay, with the different types of T cell therapy, do you expect that one will turn out to be best overall, or do you think each method will be good for different types of cancers? Oh. That's another great question. Um, I personally think uh, that it will be um, a different 
that each therapy will have their own successes. So like uh, getting back to the CAR T cells, they are super great for blood cancers, not so great for solid tumors. Um, transgenic TCRs that uh, have had some success um, in the solid tumor arena. So it might just be that there is no one silver bullet and we just have to have many different therapies for many different things. And that's okay um, because that keeps me employed and that makes me happy. So <laughs> from Jonathan, would you would down regulation be an issue with TCR when the old receptor is knocked out? Possibly, yes. And um, we are finding that when you knock out the endogenous or the original TCR, the T cells aren't super happy. So um, it's a new thing that we are exploring. It's not anything that's like a solid science as of yet. We're still kind of finessing the protocol to get uh, to get it to work correctly. So um, that's a gr another great question. So um, Hanako says, if you have some time, please fill out the short feedback survey. Um, same one on the slide. And we will make sure this series is helpful for you all. Yes. And is it possible to get a link to that paper? Absolutely. Um, I will send it to Jeannie. And um, if you all are interested, uh, Jeannie, I hope you don't mind. I just kind of volunteered you to. No, that's great. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it was pretty cool. So um, let's see. Um, I can also send out these slides if you feel like you would like to send them to your students. Or um, I also, like I said, have um, the particular videos um, and some fun comics. So this is the immune system overview and um, the coronavirus video, and you can find them on YouTube, uh, Kurt Gitzak, they're great. And then um, I'll open the floor again to for more questions, but before I run out of time, I wanna do a quick plug for upcoming events. So uh, like Jeannie said, um, you can tune in same time, same bat time, same bat channel every Tuesday. Um, and you can hear from awesome uh, researchers about the cool science that they are doing. Um, and uh, it's the same Zoom link every Tuesday in May from four to five. And I can um, just quickly say what the other ones are. Like next yes. on the 12th, Molly McDonald, uh, who's in the Emmerman lab, a graduate student, she's going to be talking about virology, um, especially zoonotic transmission and pandemics. Um, and then we have Allie Black on the 19th, who will um, be talking about some of her computational biology research in the Bedford lab. And then on the 26th, Nina Salama, who's um, a professor at uh, Fred Hutch, she'll be talking about her work with Helicobacter pylori and specifically can bacteria cause cancer. So that's our lineup for the rest of May. It looks really great. And we already are having some uh, fil people filling in for June. So I'll let you know about those as well shortly. Oh, sound! I'm I'm going to be tuning in because those sound super cool. <laughs> so, um, Jeannie also has some teaching virtual labs coming up. So, um, and that is May 18th um, from 3 to 5 p.m. If you want to um, tune in for some updates for the uh, the elephant lab, there's also a gender inclusive biology classroom in June. Um, a meeting. And that's going to be Wednesday, June 3rd from 3 to 5. Um, these were advertised in Jeannie's email. So if you're like, oh, I can't click on the screen to get to those links. If you go to the um, email that she sent, um, the, this is all in there. So in case you haven't been reading your email, there's a quick plug for it. Okay. So. Um, and then also, uh, please provide feedback because uh, we want to make sure that you get what you want out of this series. So with all of that, let's go back again to questions because there are six minutes left. Does anyone have any other burning questions about the immune system or uh, cancer therapies or kind of... Uh, Nathan Pyle, who is uh, who does these uh, 
<laughs> comics called Strange Planet. They're great if you haven't checked them out. I, I also highly suggest that. Yeah, we have time for uh, maybe one more question, one or two more questions. What else are you wondering about? And feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to just ask. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so mercy. So, how uh, how does genetic play a role in the immune system and can cancer interactions? Um, like uh, that is kind of like the um, quintessential question, right? So, um, everything starts with DNA. So, from how T cells are built to uh, the proteins that they recognize on cells, it all starts with the DNA. And so um, you can have specific genes that can make you more susceptible to developing cancers. Uh, you can have genes, we all have genes that protect us from developing cancers that um, get mutations in them down the road. And so uh, I wish that there was a succinct way to talk about how genetics play a role um, with the immune system and cancer interactions. It's a big question, unfortunately. I don't think I have time for that, but I can email you about it. Um, so which specific cells of the immune system kill? So um, T cells are uh, kind of the adaptive immune system cells that uh, one flavor of T cells. We also have any, pretty much uh, like macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils. Uh, um, let's see, uh, what am I forgetting? There's a lot of cells and some cells kill indiscriminately. They just kind of kill everything. There are some cells that are specifically to clear out parasites, some specifically for certain viruses. Um, there are there are lots of cells in the immune system, and they all do very interesting jobs. And I wish I could have I had a list of all of them, but uh, those are just a couple. So, uh, do, 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 do. oh well, I'm so glad. Uh, it's just a lot of thank yous, and so I am so glad that I hope that you got out of this what you were hoping to get. If you have any questions. Um, you can feel free to get in touch with me through the SDP folks. Um, if you are interested in having a scientist connect with your classroom or having this kind of interaction for your students, uh, please feel free to email me at uh, hutchunited at fredhutch.org and we can definitely get somebody to have this kind of interaction for your students. So, we actually have um, a whole you guys a whole series of graduate students who would like to partner with teachers to do special uh, talks for your students. So if you have an interest in that, please let me know. So Hutch United is one great source. And then we have a whole bunch of other uh, graduate students and, and other scientists who are really wanting to do something that contributes right now. So, and they're in, uh, often interested in teaching and working with teachers and students. So please let me know if that is something of interest to you. Yeah. So thank you for everyone for uh, your wonderful attention. Jeannie, thanks for letting me present yeah, today. No, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, and so, yay. Hope we see you again next week and it. give give Alicia a lot of love in the in the chat or let us know how it went for you on the um, evaluation and, and if you have suggestions for us for the future. That'd be great really nice that you could join us and um, we will see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Uh, recording will be available on our website as well. Okay. Cool beans. Bye everyone.